We are empowered by lay-driven leadership, connecting lay ministries and business people to share Christ in the marketplace in support of the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And welcome to our virtual uh, convocation that we're having. It's just been such a blessing being here at 3ABN, but I have to admit, we really miss being with everyone. I got a call earlier this week from my friend. She said, can I meet you for dinner? And I said, well, where are you? She said, in Glendale. She said, I just miss everyone so much. I wish I could have a virtual dinner with you. <laughs> so anyway, I'm here this morning with uh, my friend Christina Mello. Yeah. And Christina, just tell us a little bit about what brought you here. Sure. So we were here specifically for the YP event that took place yesterday. We had an amazing day, Patty. We had quite a bit, good number of good speakers, workshops, networking opportunities for young professionals. Um, it was a great day. That sounds really interesting. And tell me about where you're from and what you do. Yeah, so I, I'm from Orlando, Florida. I work for Advent Health in the finance area. And just a little PS, you know, the Adventist family is very small. Everywhere we go, we find people oh, yeah. that, we, that we know. And just turns out that she was at Southern when my children were there. And it's just a small, small world. So we're thrilled. And ASI brings the young professionals and all of us uh, who are more on the senior side <laughs> together in one place. And that's part of wonderful part of being in the family of God. So, Christina, would you just invite God's presence here with us this morning? Sure, absolutely. So let's bow our heads for prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath that you've given us, Father. We want to humbly ask you to bring us into your presence today and throughout the day in the program. We want to ask you to be with each specific person that's watching um, ASI this morning and throughout the day. May you be with them, with their families. And be with the whole situation that's happening right now with the pandemic and the fears that may be happening um, throughout our world. Father, we know that you have everything under control and we trust you, Father. Please be with us. In your name we pray. Amen. In answering his disciples' questions about the end of the world, Jesus said something very interesting in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. He said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached unto all the world, and then the end shall come. Today, I'm talking with Jill and Greg of 3ABN. They've been preaching the gospel at 3ABN, the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages, for 35 years now. Greg and Jill, what a privilege to be able to talk with you and to connect with you today as we're hosting our ASI program right there at 3ABN. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you today. I have a question. What is it about ASI and 3ABN, and how far back does it go? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a really good question. I know the partnership between 3ABN and ASI goes back, oh my, many, many years, of course, with uh, Mr. Danny Shelton. I know Big Sky Montana, of course, when he presented 3ABN to ASI, and uh, look what God has done. You know, it's incredible to be doing this virtual ASI here, I don't think we ever would have thought that the international convention would be here in West Frankfurt slash Thompsonville, Illinois. We should have been in like Orlando, Florida, but God is good. You know, we're still able to, even with the challenges of COVID, uh, Pastor Steve, to still get this gospel and the message of ASI around the world. So thank you for the great partnership through the years. And, and I want to say a special thank you to Greg, to you and Jill both for taking up the leadership of 3ABN. I know that this is not an easy job and that the burden of ministry at times can be heavy, but you have taken up this, uh, this helm of the 3ABN ship and we're grateful to you and very thankful that we can partner with you. Now, I wanna talk a couple of, uh, just about a couple of things and, and obviously, um, you know, this is ASI and, and we're happy that 3ABN is hosting us this weekend and uh, right there in Thompsonville, Illinois, it's just amazing that what has happened. 
But I want to say thank you on behalf of ASI and the ministries. One of the strong partnerships that we have had over the years is where 3ABN has invited the ASI ministries into the studio. Mm -hmm. And right there in the studio, they have allowed them to tell their stories to the world. And because of this, it's been an amazing opportunity for the ministries to connect with people around the world so that the people are learning about the supporting ministries of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And you have not been, uh, what I'm going to say, tight, uh, tight-fisted on this. You have allowed the ministries to raise funds right there on the 3ABN airwaves to advance the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and getting those three angels' messages to the world. So I just want to thank you personally for that and all that you have done in this regard and the attitude of generosity that 3ABN has exhibited. Thank you so uh, much, I just Pastor. want to ask you, though, as we're thinking about this, uh, what are we looking at in the future? I mean, we've experienced a pandemic. There's a lot of things going on in our world. What is 3ABN thinking about the future, and, and what does it look like? It's exciting to be partnering together with ASI and ministry. It's exciting to know that this gospel message is to go to the entire world. So we're so grateful for that. During this time of COVID, when people have been shut in, as it were, and not able to get out, we've seen an exponential increase in people watching on demand, on YouTube, on our apps, on Roku, on Amazon Fire. It has literally exploded. The growth of 3ABN, we receive responses from viewers, listeners all the time. And one of the things we're very excited about here at 3ABN is we're just breaking in to doing more on-demand programming and on-demand app that we'll have. Yeah, you know, that's really exciting, like Jill's saying, because uh, we've, we're developing a brand new 3ABN app that will have video on demand, like Jill's saying, you can get video on demand on YouTube right now. But we're going to be developing this for our 3ABN app that you can get on your smartphone, your tablet. And uh, that's really exciting for us. But not only that, uh, what I'm really excited about, a lot of people watch 3ABN Sabbath School panel, and they would like the panelists' notes. So like Jill's handwritten notes or typed notes. That's going to also be available on the brand new app from all the panelists for each week. So those are coming recipes, Bible studies that will be available with the on-demand uh, content because like we were mentioning with COVID, lots of people are going to the internet searching for things. What's happening? The end of the world, prophecy, you know, many different prophecy topics. People are looking and they're finding truth. And I want to say a great big thank you to ASI, Pastor Steve, because of ASI. Hopefully, I'm going to just kind of tease this out there. The end of this year, maybe the first part of 2021, we're going to be on some of the major television, smart TV uh, platform. So in other words, you would buy a smart TV and 3ABN's app would be right there. So that's coming. We'll give you more details. We get that uh, a little bit later on this year. Now, I think we have a graphic, Jill, of the reach of 3ABN. And I don't know if they can put that up right now, but uh, if they can, I just want to make uh, a small comment about that. And I think there's a, a graphic about the, the worldwide view of the reach of 3ABN. We're looking at and, it right uh, now. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. It's amazing. Now, uh, what I'm going to say, though, is that it appears to me that with this new age and the digital things that are happening and the Internet, that maybe you should just cover the whole globe, just paint the whole globe, <laughs> because I believe that you are reaching the entire world as, right. uh, as you are getting into these other initiatives and the on-demand stuff mm -hmm. and the the Roku and the smart TVs and all of this. So I just want to thank you for what you're doing in that. And uh, I just want to ask Jill, though, Jill, is there a story of somebody's life who's been impacted, maybe mm. even during this COVID season, of through watching 3ABN? Absolutely. We hear stories all the time, Pastor Steve, people whose lives have been changed for eternity. I just got a letter this week from a prisoner. It says Mrs. Morricone, he's in a maximum security prison and he's accepted the truth of the Sabbath and is now a Seventh-day Adventist. And he didn't have any money to send, but he sent eight envelopes. I don't know if you can see this, but eight envelopes that are stamped and that was his contribution. So we hear from people all over the world whose lives have been changed and who have accepted Jesus as a result of this ministry. You know, I just want to say, let's keep the three angels' messages as our urgent calling and go to the entire world. Thank you, 3ABN, for what you are doing. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Thank you.
You know, one big thing about being part of ASI is there's this sense of belonging. And um, once you get involved with ASI, you feel you're part of a, like a family. And this, uh, you know, people get attracted by common interests. And if you have the interest of sharing the gospel in an active way, you, you like to go to the same place, right? If you, are, if you have a specific interest, like say, surfing or mountain climbing, you want to be with those people, right? Because you exchange ideas. You are thinking about the next trip. In this case, or the next adventure. In this, in this case, ASI is a hub and people are attracted by people that think the same way. So what attracts me? What makes me come back? What makes me motivate and participate in this organization actively? Is because I'm naturally excited. You know, I want to um, share my thoughts with others. I want to be influenced by others that think the same way, that have this common goal. So it's this common ground of interest that puts ASI my agenda. And I don't do it as, uh, as a sacrifice. It's just a natural thing because we want to participate in God's work in the mission of the Adventist movement in an active way. We have a tremendous opportunity for growth. So ASI can impact the church, work together with the church so that Jesus will come even sooner than we think. Most of the world has no idea what time it is. It is judgment hour. We are called to fear God and give glory to him. We need to understand where we came from. And the first angel's message calls us to worship our creator. We want to invite you to join those men, women, and boys and girls around the world in taking the three angels' messages to the world. Join the 3 a.m. call today. It's so interesting to hear about these different stories of how God is spreading the message all around the world. Donna, can you tell us about what we're going to be hearing about next? Happy to. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I had the opportunity to interview someone that I have never met. Now, that's scary, but I'm telling you, he made me feel like family. This is the president of ADRA, Michael Kruger. Let's go and hear what he has to say. Hello, Michael, and welcome to ASI. We're so happy that you've joined us. Can you please tell us who you are and what you do? Don, it's such a privilege to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I'm the president of ADRA International and uh, coming to you this morning, I've been in this role as, uh, for about nine months now, previously as the CFO of ADRA uh, throughout the entire network. So uh, privileged to serve the Lord in this capacity right now. Oh, that sounds good. And you told me that you were a businessman. Is that correct? That is correct. I, I came into this position uh, from the business world. I owned my own business for some 25 years in my native South Africa, uh, never believing that I would transition into a role like this. But uh, very shortly can tell you, I uh, read the book uh, called The Radical Prayer by Pastor Dor Derek Morris the one day. Uh, he challenged uh, the reader to pray the radical prayer of what the Lord can do in your life. And I can tell you after praying that prayer, it's uh, uprooted my life and that of my family. We now find ourselves here in this role, serving God in this capacity. And it's just been a most wonderful journey uh, to, to walk with God. Amen. Michael, can you tell us how God is working through ADRA? Donna, there's, there's so much happening in Everett at the moment, and I'm just going to briefly share with you some of those stories. You know, once the COVID crisis hit, uh, we had to pivot and change our business model overnight. Uh, but I can tell you, God has been at the center of everything that we have been doing. I can share a brief story with you uh, out of the country of El Salvador. Uh, within El Salvador, Edra has operated there for many years, and uh, we have uh, projects putting in constructing greenhouses, which we call micro tunnels. And uh, we've been doing that for many years. Uh, and there was a particularly young man with the name of Mario uh, that uh, our workers down in El Salvador met, a young man who dropped out of university, uh, not having the money uh, to, uh, to complete his studies. And he met up with ADRA. Uh, they collaborated and partnered, and he became one of the beneficiaries of these tunnels. And uh, working with the ADRA workers, he was starting to uh, to sow the seeds. He was being taught to fertilize and, and to harvest, but at the same time, interacting with ADRA workers who were strong Christians and come from a strong Christian background. Uh, 
And they brought him on a journey. And the beautiful part, the miracle of God that, that was performed over here is that uh, on the day that the government in El Salvador announced the, the national shelter in place, every one of those micro tunnels that Adra had been working on came into full bloom. In other words, all the food, all the produce was immediately and totally available uh, to all of those people who would have faced food shortages and starvation. But at the time, God came through and provided on that exact day when it was needed. And Donna, I believe that this, when we put God at the center of what we do, this is when he can perform the miracles. You know, Ellen White tells us that when, when we intercede in prayer for others, we open divine channels of God's blessing. And I believe that if we put God at the center of what Adra does, uh, whether it is this traditional humanitarian work or the disaster response, he takes us that extra mile. He, 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 he's the one who brings about that beautiful blessing of having all of those micro tunnels come into full bloom on the exact day when it was needed. We didn't know that as, as ADRA professionals, but he did. And by putting God there, Mario was blessed. He could eat. His family could eat. He had excess crops over that he could actually then distribute to, uh, to the market, create income for his family. And I believe that as God remains center, we, we continue to be an enormous blessing to the world around us. Oh, amen. Isn't that exciting what God is doing through Mario Amen. and others? Now, during this crisis, this COVID crisis, what has been happening with ADRA around the world? We're operating and responding in about 70 countries around the globe at the moment. Uh, many of those are traditional responses. Some are new and exciting. But Donna, the one story that's come out of all of this, Adra's had to respond to a global crisis. We didn't have the capacity. We didn't have all the hands necessary in order to do that. But the one story that has resonated here is that Adra has partnered with the church. Thousands of church members have come around, uh, have, have come to Adra, partnered with us around the globe, made themselves available. And if, one, if we've learned one lesson out of this is that when Abra and the church collaborate, we are stronger together. We're able to reach people. We are able to make an impact uh, in people's lives and, and an impact further than the physical help to the vulnerable community. We introduce them to Jesus, who is the ultimate hope. There's so many things happening. We have distributed uh, PPEs or personal protective equipment to uh, Adventist clinics and hospitals around the globe. We've even distributed to many of our Adventist hospitals here within the United States. Uh, we've been able to change you know, the, the lives and protect frontline workers, and it's been an enormous privilege to be able to do that. Uh, we've got some very exciting new projects on the go. We have an app currently being developed with the help of the South American Division and their uh, IT infrastructure. It is a psychosocial app that uh, anyone who has a cell phone will be able to go onto that app. That will connect them with thousands of Adventist volunteers uh, through South America who can uh, speak to them, who can encourage them. A lot of families in lockdown or in sheltering place, there's a, a lot of emotional and mental and uh, distress coming to families. Uh, we'll be able to connect them to them. Those people can share God with them. And uh, who knows uh, what can come of that, what seeds can be planted. Uh, in serious cases, people can be referred to professional counseling. But uh, Donna, in short, uh, if we put God at the center of everything that we do, he comes through for us. He, he changes the impact of what Adra already does. He expands it. As I say, those beautiful words of Ellen White, uh, we open up those divine channels of blessing. And I believe that is what Adra in collaboration with the church can be stronger and can be the blessing to the world and to vulnerable communities that God wants us to be. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. And thank you that we can work together to help finish this work because Jesus is coming soon. Amen. That was really interesting, especially about the micro tunnels. I think that right now God is calling us around the world to be growing food. That was very interesting. Donna, can you share with us about the work of the stubs in Cuba? Well, put your seatbelts on because the stories that you're going to be blessed to hear today will truly touch your heart. And it was a privilege to interview Henry. Let's go and see what he has to say to us. Hello, Henry, and welcome to ASI. We're so happy you joined us. When I see you, I think about Cuba. Please share with us what is going on in Cuba. Thank you, Donna. It's really good to be with you and with the ASI family. I wish it was real time, but praise the Lord. 
The gospel is advancing in Cuba, Donna. New villages, new towns, new cities are being entered for the first time for Jesus Christ, and all under the, the banner of the practical gospel of caring about people, relieving suffering, medical missionary work. Now, you know, we've come to a time, uh, Donna, when every member of the church uh, was written in uh, Seven Testimonies, page 62, should take hold of the medical missionary work. It's so like, how is this coming about? Let me tell you a little bit. Only um, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, the four pillars that God gave us in Cuba, uh, we're trying to be faithful to. Number one is to train. We use a modified light curriculum and training Cubans, especially youth, in medical missionary practical gospel. Number two, we send them, we interview, hire, and send them out to work full-time in unreached cities and frontiers of Cuba. Number three, we harvest uh, by uh, bringing down schools and church groups and youth from North America to hold harvest campaigns in these cities. And we buy homes in these cities and we stay and nurture those flocks until they're not only recognized companies, but organized Seventh-day Adventist churches under the conference. So kind of how do our people work? We want to tell you a little bit about that as well as a couple stories uh, and what's happening. What do these workers do to raise up new followers for Jesus, uh, for Jesus Christ? It's so interesting. Um, all of them do something different, Donna. Uh, some of them are, are more medical professionals, have a medical background, but anything you do to relieve suffering to relieve burdens, just to relieve the, the issues of life that people deal with, to genuinely care about people is Christ's method for opening up new work. I want to tell you about somebody a week ago we sent, uh, uh, recently we sent Rodelio and Noriski to a, a, a new city, and last week we heard this story. They went to a town called Tikotia. We bought a house in that town. There's a picture of them. They moved into that house, and they were wondering, Lord, what do the house was on the main street very close to the bus station and they felt impressed we need to do something all these people are at the bus station they come there to find their work in the morning um what can we do there well they went to the bus station and looked around and the bathrooms were just intolerable um it's a place you don't want to go in cuba and these are the only public restrooms in that city they're at the bus station and you just don't want to go in there. A lot of times they don't work, they're dark, they're filthy, they're just nasty. Um, it's, it's a place that uh, we always avoid and most people avoid unless it's emergency. Well, our medical missionaries prayed, Lord, how do, we, how do we minister to those people? And they felt like the answer came, bathrooms. So Rodelio and Noriski, on their own accord, they bought disinfectant with their little salary of $25 a month. They went out and, and bought disinfectants. They scrubbed every inch of those bathrooms, even the walls. And they, they placed sweet-smelling scents in there. And immediately the people began to ask uh, the lady, the uniformed officer that's there in charge of kind of directing traffic in the morning and helping people find the work and the transportation to work and those kind of things. And they said, what's going on here? Why, why are these bathrooms so clean? And this official in uniform, this woman, she would point to the house across the street and she said, that's the new church in town. And that's that's the pastor and his wife that are in charge of the church. And they do that. And so they're doing this every week. And I just praise the Lord. Last week, we found out already they have six people ready for baptism. This, amen, Donna. Amen, Henry. Six it's people amen. ready for baptism because they were cleaning bathrooms. Isn't God amazing? That's medical missionary work, Donna. That That's is what it medical is. missionary work, yes. And, and so the results across Cuba, we just wanted to say, praise the Lord, we have greater than 100 workers, medical missionaries, working now in 55 cities. Um, and we have 55 churches that are growing up. Eight of these have already been organized, and 47 um, are, are coming up. And uh, we got another story just a couple of days ago from one of our workers sent these pictures. This is a lady, Yipsy, that lost part of one of her feet and, uh, and the other foot is deteriorating. Yipsy 
was very disappointed, very discouraged, um, down and out. She just want, didn't want to live anymore. She couldn't play with her grandchildren. She couldn't do housework. She lost a foot. She was just down and out. And our medical missionary in her town, um, Deanne Liss, came and just ministered her, cleaned her house, washed her clothes. And Yipsy was like so amazed, so truly grateful. She said, you know, before you came, I wanted to end my life. I had decided I'm going to kill myself. And with tears in her eyes, she said, now I know that there is a Savior and that he loves me. And I want to give myself to Christ. And that's just another conversion. But everybody works in a, in a different way. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, God is working in Cuba. And I know that part of the offering is going to be helping your projects in Cuba. And we only have a few seconds left. But how is that offering going to help quickly? Praise the Lord. Next to the seminary, Donna, adjacent to the seminary, God has given us a farm and some beautiful, beautiful property. And we've already built through ASI's help a, a lovely, lovely building. Uh, a, it's a multi-purpose building. It was originally meant to be a girl's dorm, but we use it for everything. And now we need desperately a new classrooms uh, or a place for classrooms and cafeteria and bathrooms in this facility to train our workers. In the past, we've been able to use the seminary, but now with their master's degree program, they're so full, we have not been able to take over their campus for a month and do a light curriculum, and we need our own space. So this offering, it's really a $170,000 project, but about half of that is being asked from ASI, and it's going to make it possible for us to train new workers. We have 500 cities in Cuba to go, Donna, and we want to reach every city for Christ. Amen. Thank you, Henry. What an inspiring story from Cuba. And Donna, there's a new other, another update. Will you please share what we're going to hear next? There certainly is. And I get the privilege of actually introducing my father-in-law. This man is passionate about building. And today he's going to tell you more about the story of the One Day Church. And he has a partner. Dr. Bell. So let's see what they have to say together. I would like to tell you about the One Day Church Project, the ASI Project. But before I do, let me give you just a little background. The ASI uh, Church Project started with actually Elder Ted Wilson several years ago when he sent the message of the need of roofs and structures in Africa. ASI developed the Roofs Over Africa, where they did 11,000 roofs for our brothers and sisters in Africa. This has truly been a blessing. But from there, we developed the ASI One Day Church Project. And so far, there have been over 9,000 One Day Church projects throughout the world. When you think of it, 20,000 churches in Africa have a church home because of the One Day Project. Now, last year, we sent 300 One Day Churches to Zambia, Tanzania, and Madagascar. And today, we're going to emphasize Madagascar. Now, if we could show some pictures of Madagascar, look at here. Here is the map. Now, see those stars on that map? Each one represents a beacon of light of a One Day Church. It has been the last two years not only erected, but finished. Today, I want to show you some inside of the One Day Church. Here's a church on the outside. See how they finished it off night? Now, here are the elders on the inside of the church. It's decorative, bright. Here's another church. This one here is a One Day structure. It's finished. Look at the members. See the happy faces on the inside? It's the inside that counts. Here's another church. Same one, inside, see it's full. This is another church. You can see them going to church up that dusty path to their church home. Now, in the inside, we can, we can see that it's full and being used. The one-day church is so important in these countries. Dr. Bell is with us. Dr. Bell is from Madagascar. Dr. Bell, tell us what's happening in Madagascar as a result of the one-day program. 
Happy Sabbath to each one of us. Uh, it has been uh, very delightful and nice to partner with uh, uh, Mr. Gawin McNeilis regarding uh, church building in Madagascar. Uh, I'm telling you, for the last three years, uh, we've been able to send out uh, about 30, 35 uh, containers uh, full of churches, uh, uh, churches in the container. Uh, the church has been uh, growing because of that. Uh, we have a church that uh, started from uh, uh, 30 members when the church established, and the one the church has been built, uh, that uh, number double, triple. And as soon as the church has been built, it's full. We have a capacity of 100 plus of each church, and uh, those are almost full, and they need to have an additional church uh, again. Now... Um, I can uh, uh, tell you for the last uh, uh, three years, the church in Madagascar has a growth of about 13,000 churches a year. Since the last two years, that number jumped to 18,000 members a year. So there is about 5,000 or 6,000 extra, and majority of those are the result of uh, the building of one day, day church. It is very important to know that uh, members really need place to stay and place to worship. Uh, those members have been struggling, especially those in a country, in a rural area, to find some people who can help them. And this has been very good tools that we can um, have opportunity that we can help them grow. Uh, this is a mission for building, and uh, it is working. I'm telling you one story about a lady. Uh, she is in about uh, 80 years old. She has been dreaming that one day I would like to have church in my area. She is planting corns. And so for years and years, she has been praying about having Adventist church in that uh, community. Um, now, one time, uh, one the church arrived about three years ago, and she and her church was uh, beneficial uh, because they get one of those churches. Now, those people who told her that she was dreaming that would not be happening, those people who have mocked her now became an Adventist when they want the church built up. So that is a story of something that is really real and made uh, a special uh, contribution to this community. One time, uh, another church was building a church they would not afford to build, and uh, we had this one day church, and these members divided in seven. So seven, um, group of seven, those who are Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and so on. So what they did, they prayed and fasting. One group prayed on Monday, the next group prayed on Tuesday, the other group prayed on Wednesdays, and they saved the money for their uh, meals to, to contribute for the building of the church. And that church has been built. You know, within three months, four months of uh, uh, beginning of uh, the construction, the church has been built. We have over 100 one day churches in Madagascar now for the last three years and uh, two schools. And so uh, we are very uh, thankful that we were able to uh, uh, part of this growth uh, of the members uh, in Madagascar. And also number one, number two, uh, it helped unity among the church members. When they have a project together, they unite and they unite in prayer. They unite in uh, uh, construction, they unite in evangelism. So this is something that is concrete, that is very tangible evidence of God's work among his people. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Gawin McNeilis, for being part of this. Thank you, Dr. Bell. As I look at the One Day Church, I don't see steel. I don't see bricks and mortar. I see young and old. I see young and old someday in heaven worshiping under the tree. One day church is evangelism through construction, where you, it equals souls today, but you endow the future. There will be many, many people in heaven as a result of it. Thank you, Dr. Bell.
Thank you very much. Oh Lord my God, when I eat awesome wonder, consider all the wills thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout thy universe display. When through the world, when through the forest, I wonder, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the tree. for our mission story for Sabbath School to give us an update on New Beginnings picture rolls. Let's go back for those who, I, I can't believe how, might not know about picture rolls, but how did this get started? Well, it happened like this, Debbie. Steve Dickman and I were at an OCI meeting in Portugal, and we were sitting around the lunch table, and he was telling me about the TMI project in Rwanda, and said that there were thousands of lay people trained to do evangelism using the New Beginnings workbook, but they had no graphic support. So the idea was created, we've got to do something for those who are sharing the gospel in areas where there is no electricity. 
And so the picture rolls was born. You know, actually, it's really kind of like the second generation of picture rolls. The first generation was the Savage School picture rolls. That may have been be well before your time, but that was an ASI project too. So this is really pretty exciting. I do remember those <laughs> as I've traveled around the world. I've seen those all over. So oh. I know that the picture roll project has a amazing legacy. Absolutely. Now, I, we want to really thank ASI and our ASI family and those other donors who have been able to give to support this project. So what's in the future? What's this project about that we're looking at now for our offering in action? The future is as big as we can dream, Debbie, because the results of what has happened and the requests are amazing. Are the, there a lot of requests? Do people want a few thousand of these? Try 30,000 in one division. Wow. It's incredible. Wow, so there's such a big need for Huge. these. Tell us about the distribution that's currently uh, that we have with the picture rolls? So up to this point, we've distributed primarily in Africa okay. and Asia and Papua New Guinea. That's quite a number of countries for this. Continents. Continents, true. Yes. So we're looking at a lot of, okay, a wide distribution. And how, can you demonstrate for us, how is it used? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So the New Beginnings Project is known around the world as showing the gospel. So let's okay. go to one of the sermons. I have one here. By the way, this is not just a sermon. We have health talks oh, that are okay. included. Our team at the uh, Justin and Creative Group created some amazing graphics for us. So here's a health talk on charcoal. Okay. And just one picture, the person who is giving the demonstration can walk through the steps of how to make charcoal and how to use it. And then the sermon coming up in seven pictures. This one is on the second coming. You know, the preaching of Noah and paralleling our day. Mm. A storm is coming, relentless in its fury. People need to get ready for the flood that is soon to break upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. Jesus is coming again, just as they saw him go. And then the beautiful, wow. the blessed hope. So this is just a demonstration. Seven pictures for one sermon. Okay, and there are two reams, so to speak, of the picture rolls with 13 on each. That is exactly right. Okay. There are two picture rolls. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not just any ordinary paper either. Mm -hmm. This is waterproof okay. and tear resistant. Uh, okay. So it's right. uh, an amazing product. Okay, so it can withstand a lot of, a lot of pressure. It can, okay. and it comes in this waterproof tube. Okay, all right. This is a great show and tell. Now tell us, so this is the script book that comes along with it. So it has the sermons. People don't have to write their own thing. They can just follow right this and they the just follow right it. along just like new beginnings with the little thumbnail picture yes. and just follow right along okay now tell us some um, what kind of things are you hearing from the field how are they how are they feeling about using these well let's go to a few pictures okay. we have some pictures right. and I want to show our audience mm -hmm. this is uh, me demonstrating or using the picture roll in Ethiopia when we did the TMI project okay. in Ethiopia the next picture here that we have is the distribution in Zambia. We gave these to pioneer missionaries on the front lines at Riverside Farms, and they went all throughout sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ using the picture rolls. This is what often happens. Underneath the tree, you see that? Isn't that yes. uh, just an, yes. an am amazing picture? And so it's not only for kids. This picture right here shows adults learning as well. Mm -hmm. Because remember, this is sometimes the only entertainment that people might have in a village. And this really draws the crowd. Wow. There was one village where there was a group of young children who were learning the Bible stories, and they were so excited, and they said, we've got to go to that church. No other church has ah, pictures like this. Oh, okay. Can you imagine what it would be like, Debbie, to see the second coming 
in a pictorial form for the first time. That's exciting, exciting. Now I know you have, we have just a minute, a little over a minute left. I want to really hear a story about how things are being used. All right, so let's go to the next picture okay. here and we're going to take a look at the distribution okay. uh, in Southeast Asia. We've partnered together with ASAP Ministries mm -hmm. and they distributed them throughout that region. This picture shows us Papua New Guinea. Now, as you know, there was a major push this year right. for Papua New Guinea that was modified because of our pandemic situation. But the picture rolls have been used in countless villages, just like that last one that you saw okay. in the picture. And people are coming to know Jesus Christ oh, that's wonderful. in villages around the world because of the Picture Roll Project. Well, we are so grateful to have this um, on our list of offering in action. And actually, this is um, one of the overflow. So, and how was, what's the cost for this? You know, it's an amazing investment for just about $100. Oh. That's all, $100, okay. you can get a set of the two picture rolls okay. to go to the hands of a frontline missionary. So people could sponsor, you know, 10 picture rolls and, and they know exactly what they can give in order to send these out. That's exactly right. Oh, that's wonderful. Rodney, thank you so much for all of the work that AU and ASI are doing so that we can spread the gospel far and wide. Amen. Thank you, thank you Debbie. Give me the Bible, star of gladness green, to cheer the wanderer, alone and tempest tossed. No storm can hide that peaceful radiance beam me, since Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Give me the Bible, holy message shining, thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and law combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible when my heart is broken, when sin and grief have filled my soul with fear. Give me the precious words by Jesus spoken, Hold a face lamp to show my Savior near. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and law combining. Till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible. Enlightened, teach me the danger of these realms below. That lamp of safety o'er the gloom shall brighten. That light alone the path of peace can show. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, law and love combine, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Good morning and welcome to our ASI Sabbath School. It's such a blessing to be together today to study the Word of God. I have with me a panel that we are going to be engaged in an interactive discussion. And I want to explain a little bit about how that's going to work because we want you to have your Bible open and also respond to some questions that we have. So we have a website that is going to be put on the screen and we're going to show you exactly what to do. You go to slido.com you're gonna put in your participant ID. You can see it's a 19794, and you're going to be able to interact with our Sabbath School class. So at this time, I'd like to uh, ask Michelle Ducamus to have our opening prayer before we get into our study. Sure, let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for the chance to, to join together on the Sabbath. Thank you for a chance to study your word, Lord. 
Um, as we are studying about the Holy Spirit and witnessing today, we need your Holy Spirit. Uh, it's not something we just want to talk about. We, we need your presence. And so I want to pray for that right now, that you would join us here on this panel and you would join um, all of us that are, that are watching, that are participating from wherever we are, that you would guide these discussions and let them be for your honor and for your glory. So we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What a powerful lesson this has been. And as we are going to get into our lesson study, uh, Steve is going to read for us the text that is the memory text. Steve. So, Rodney, our memory text today comes from Acts chapter 4, verse 31. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture. Many probably have this memorized and uh, could probably repeat it with me, but I want to read it today from the New King James Version. And this is what it says. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Amen. Thank you so much, Steve. So I want to ask everyone here on our panel, have any of you ever had an experience where you prayed and after you were done, the room was shaken? Any one of you had that experience before? I'm going to, Rodney, I'm going to be the first to admit no. No, okay. Any, anyone, anyone else? Ranella? Mm, not, not physically not, shaken. Not physically no. shaken. Was it a physical shaking that took place, do you think? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Could have been. Could have been, could have been. Well, let me tell you just a little story of an experience that I had that was the closest thing that I had to hmm. this experience. Right. We were doing a Friday night uh, Bible study. I was leading out and we were looking at John chapter 10, verse 10, where it talks about how Satan comes to steal and to kill and destroy. And immediately when I read that and I said, we have an enemy, Satan is really out to get us immediately we had an earthquake. I live in wow. Southern California. <laughs> so that was a shaking wow. experience. Uh, but I too have not uh, had that experience that we read here in Acts chapter 4. But that's what God is really wanting us to be involved in. Now, I'd like for us to put up a poll question. We want to get some audience uh, interaction here. So again, we want you to go to slido.com and put in your uh, participant ID 19794. We can have that question up again and we're going to encourage you to respond to us. The question is, how do you feel about taking the three angels messages to every person on the planet? What is your response? You can choose, A, it sounds nice, but it's impossible. <laughs> B, it is impossible. C, I pray for the Holy Spirit to use me to accomplish this. So we want you to be thinking about that, respond to that. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. But the whole question is based off of Sabbath afternoon's lesson mm -hmm. study, yeah. where we looked at the Gospel Commission. Ranella, when you hear Gospel Commission, what do you think of? What is the Gospel Commission? Well, I think of Jesus' words, of course, when he says, go into all the world to preach the gospel to every, uh, you know, to, to every all creature, nations, right? right? Every creature. And I think, um, you know, of course, of Revelation 14 and the part that stands out to me most is that we're supposed to preach the gospel as a witness to all nations. Amen. Beautiful. So... Uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 15, we alluded to Mark 16, 15, preach the gospel to every creature. Now, uh, Curtis, there was a challenge that these early believers had, and the lesson brings it out very well. What was the challenge that these early believers faced? Well, it seemed that it, it was just uh, too great of a task, really, you know, to, to take this message to the whole world. In fact, uh, if you look in Matthew 28, uh, 17, where just before the Gospel Commission came, it says some doubted. Mm -hmm. And this even relates to our poll question here that we just read. Um, does it seem like this is 
you know, too great of a task to take this message to the whole. And this was perhaps what they were feeling like at this time. But then it goes on to say, all power is given me in heaven and in earth. And then the commission comes. But then at the end, it says, uh, lo, I am with you always, even to the end. Amen. That's a powerful promise. So as we're thinking about that early commission, what were those disciples lacking? <laughs> A lot of things. <laughs> what was that, Michelle? Let's just name some of the things that they were lacking. Well, they probably didn't have all the money they thought they needed. They probably didn't have as many people as they thought they needed. They How probably many did lacked it start the transportation with? methods. Well, 12, 70, 120. Exactly. <laughs> what about a few languages they were missing? Languages that they were missing. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about today. What is our challenge as a church trying to take the three angels' messages to all of the world? What are some of our challenges? Anyone? Rod, Rod, yes, Steve. Rod, if, if, if we look at this and compare ourselves, let's say, to the early church, generally speaking, there's a lot more of us. There's no question about that. There's millions of Seventh-day Adventists scattered around the globe now. We now have all the modes of transportation possible. We have the internet. We have so many things available to us. So as I ponder this question, it really makes some sense. When you think of what they were facing versus what we're facing, but it still seems we're lacking the same thing. And that's the Holy Spirit. Mm, very, very interesting. So I really enjoy missions. I minored in missions when I was in college. And so it always intrigues me about statistics about how many people are considered unreached. Now, Curtis, I know that you also do a lot of work with ASAP mm -hmm. Ministries. How many people are we talking about that are considered unreached in our world today? Well, I don't know an exact number, Rodney. No um, one really knows an exact number, but I've heard something like 40% of the world right. is really in considered unreached. Mm -hmm. Right. And the barriers that we have are really challenging ones with yeah. politics and religion and uh, ethnic diversity and oppression and governments that are restricting religious freedom. So we do have a lot of challenges. But Steve, you've nailed it right on the head. Our greatest need is the Holy Spirit, which brings us to Sunday's lesson. Mm -hmm. Let's take a little bit of time and look at that lesson where it talks about Jesus' gift to his church. There are several verses that were highlighted on that lesson. While you're thinking about what to do, let's just uh, put up the response to the poll and let's see uh, what kind of audience participation we were able to get on the first one. Let's bring up the uh, web page that shows the results of the Slido poll. If we can do that, that would be fantastic. So we can actually see how people responded. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much. We have 98% of you who responded saying, I pray for the Holy Spirit to use me to help accomplish this. Isn't that good Amen. news? 2% said it is impossible. Mm -hmm. So it does from a human perspective. Sure. Doesn't it look like it's absolutely impossible? There's no way we can do it. So we need the Holy Spirit. Let's talk more about that from mm -hmm. Sunday's lesson. Who's got a comment from the promise that Jesus gave about the parakletos? I, I had a comment on that. I, I really liked how the lesson brought out that word parakletos being a helper, a comforter. But, you know, when I look that up in the Greek, it's also an advocate or an intercessor. And actually the same word that was used in 2 John chapter 2, verse uh, 1, where it says that Jesus is our parakletos with the Father. And so that kind of gave uh, some meaning to it to me, even more than just, oh, a nice, nice comforter. He'll be with you. But no, this is someone who's actually like fighting for you, advocating for you. That is very powerful. Again, the text that you were alluding to was 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. Is that correct? I think I said 2 John, but okay. I could be wrong. Okay. All right. <laughs> Fantastic. Excellent. Uh, another comment about the promise. Rodney, Rodney here, here's, what, here's what I think about this promise. When I read it, it still kind of bothers me. I think I'm a little bit like the disciples because this is what it says. Jesus says, it's expedient for you that I go away. 
I personally would love to have Jesus Christ right beside me, giving me direction, face-to-face -face contact, person-to-person. -person. During this pandemic, we've suffered a lot of distancing from people and a lack of the what we would normally expect as uh, association and, and visiting and that kind of thing. So Jesus, I'm sure, was right, though, in that the Holy Spirit can be a closer companion than even Jesus right by my side. But I still need to get to that experience with the Holy Spirit. Powerful thought. Thank you very much for sharing. And I think that's a perfect segue, actually, into our next question. And we're going to put that up on the screen at this point. Question number two. Uh, we want you just to think about this one. We, we don't have a response for this one, but we want you to think about it. Are you in the habit of specifically praying daily for the Holy Spirit in your life? Yes, no, or sometimes. During ASI, we've had these thought questions, and we have encouraged you to be brutally honest with yourself. And I hope that you've had time for introspection and saying, am I really praying daily to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Am I asking God to help me share the three angels' messages? So let's come back to Monday's lesson now and the whole idea of uh, what the Holy Spirit does. So Again, I'm looking to the panel. Bring out some highlights. Renella, bring out a highlight from Monday's lesson. What, what did you see on Monday's lesson that was so profound? Um, yeah, you know, they were talking about the series of verses that we've all read in Acts where there's just this momentum that's building and building and people are being baptized and there's just this general sense of victory, right? And I think that it's incredible to see the work of the Holy Spirit in people's lives, but just kind of tagging onto Sunday's lesson too, there was a work that every single person had to do because the Holy Spirit is a helper. The Holy Spirit doesn't just do everything for us, right? Or else we'd already be in heaven. Part of the work of sanctification is that we are a part of that process and he comes alongside and helps us. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit and the latter rain power that we saw in Acts and that we're hoping for now, um, I think it's important to know that the um, the power that comes is uh, is expanding and amplifying the work that's already being done by the people. So he's a helper that comes and just gives power to the work that's being done. Amen. That's beautiful. Thank you very much, Renella. Curtis, did you have uh, well, another only, thought on this? It's one? interesting. Not only do we see the Holy Spirit working in the people that, that are hearing the message, but the Holy Spirit was working in the hearts of the disciples, the people that at one point were very haughty, proud, argumentative, you know, in nature. Now we see a unity among them. And so the Holy Spirit does that work as well so that then our witness can be much more effective. Mm, powerful. And the lesson on Monday's lesson is called A Church filled with the Spirit's power. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the difference between an individual filled with the Holy Spirit's power and a church filled with the Holy Spirit's power. Mm. How important is this idea of being individually filled and corporately filled with the Holy Spirit? Let's talk mm. about that. The, Steve? The way, the way I read the, uh, the account in Acts is that there was a group of people gathered in that upper room. As they were thinking about and praying for the Holy Spirit, there was a group of people gathered there. That was what we would call at that time the church. Mm. But when we see the Holy Spirit falling down on them, that the tongues of fire were upon each one of them. It wasn't uh, that, that the fire came into the room and they saw it on the wall or they saw it here or there. It was it was the spirit was empowering each individual and that's how the church became empowered then and i believe it's how we will become empowered now powerful very good very good so how many of you have read the book steps to personal revival by pastor hal bile yeah have you read that book yeah, yeah good book would you recommend that book to our Fine. viewing audience what? yes, yes. I would encourage you, uh, my friend, if you have not yet read Steps to Personal Revival, that you would take the opportunity 
to read this book that talks about our need of individually asking for the Holy Spirit, for the baptism of the Spirit on a daily basis. It's not something Amen. that we just do one time. Say, Lord, please give me the Holy Spirit. And that's it. It's a daily thing. And that reminds me of John chapter 15. John chapter 15, you know, Jesus gives us that illustration of himself being the vine and us being the branches. And then would one of you read for us verse 4 and 5, John 15, 4 and 5? I can read it. Michelle, go ahead. Sure. John 15, verse 4 and 5, it says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Mm, powerful. So the idea of abiding, Curtis, I see you have, you have a thought. Go well, ahead. There's, there's another verse that comes to mind in Luke 11, verse 13, uh, where Jesus is longing to give us that gift. He's longing and it describes it in verse 13 of Luke 11. It says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more is your heavenly Father to give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. He's just waiting for us to ask. He has this gift and he's just wanting to, to bestow that on us. But we need to realize our need and realize that without him, we can do nothing. He's just longing to give us that gift. Amen, amen. And then the church will be, as it says, empowered mm -hmm. to do what? What's the church going to be empowered for? To take the gospel to the entire world. And uh, Pastor Finley, in this lesson, wrote about the importance of planting churches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? Yeah. Did you notice that specific that. point? Don't you, aren't you inspired by the ASI mission stories of the partnership between the lay people and the church working together to plant new congregations? Doesn't that inspire you? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I hope and pray mm -hmm. that for each one of us, we can always be thinking that this is a movement. It's not just let's build a mega church and settle mm -hmm. down, right? Mm -hmm. That's what makes the Seventh-day Adventist church so dynamic and so different. And another thing that you'll notice is these stories, these mission in action and the ministry and offering stories are coming from all around the world. So this is a movement that we've taken, you know, as a church and at ASI here, really this needs to go to the whole world. And Amen. this is part of filling... Fulfilling, uh, Fulfilling the religion. gospel yes. commission. Amen. All right, we're going to put up another question for you to think about. Let's put up question number three. Question number three is so very important. How do I respond to the call of the Holy Spirit to share the gospel? A, respond without question. B, wait for further instructions. Or C, ignore. All right, my friend, I would like to encourage you to be pondering this. And we're going to look at Tuesday's lesson. We have several different stories from the Bible that show us how different people responded to this call. We have some who responded immediately to the call. Who was that? Who responded immediately to the call? Philip. Philip. Philip <laughs> responded immediately to the call. Why did he respond immediately? What was it that prepared him for that response? He had the gift of the Holy Spirit. He had the opportunity and the habit, I believe, of praying daily mm. for the Holy Spirit. Mm. If he had forgotten to pray that morning, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Baptize me afresh. Please guide me. Do you think he would have made his divine appointment? He likely wouldn't have. No. Yeah, been listening. No. He Rodney, there's... Rodney, there's something interesting as I'm thinking about several comments I've heard from member in action stories and different ones talking during this very ASI conference we're having right now. And that is people talking about these divine appointments mm -hmm. and how they pray for them daily mm -hmm. in their business and how they see God working and actually providing for them those divine appointments. So this, this applies in our day and to us, just like it did to Philip. Amen. That's beautiful. That's, that's fantastic. Mm. Now, on the other side of things, are there people when the call of God came that responded negatively or hesitantly? 
Let's say, who was hesitant when they received the call of God? The Holy Spirit was, was tugging on their heart and they were hesitant in their response. Who do you think of? Think of Jonah. Think of Jonah. <laughs> All right. Jo Jonah was not just hesitant. He ran the other way completely, right? Completely the other way. What lessons can we learn from Jonah? Don't run from mm, God. Yeah. <laughs> don't yeah. run, don't so run from lessons. God or a big problem can mm. occur. All right. Anyone else? I think of Moses. You know, I can identify with that. Lord, I, you know, I'm, I'm not eloquent with speech. I, I, can't, I can't do this. You know, pick somebody else that's more, you know, more fluent, can speak. So that's uh, one thing that comes to mind. You know, we, we look to ourselves, really. Yes. And we're going to, we have so many reasons to doubt when we look at ourselves. Yes, yeah. yes. So Moses is a good example of someone who was just a little bit reluctant, right? God had to really press and come again and again and try to bring him back to that. Yeah. Michelle, you have something. I mean, a, similar. I was thinking of the prophet Jeremiah who said, mm -hmm. you know, I am but a youth. Mm -hmm. You know, how, mm -hmm. how can I do this? And I, I've thought about that and thinking, you know, wow, it, will people listen to me? Maybe because I'm, or I'm young or I'm, I'm a woman or will they even know or really care? And so maybe there's some hesitancy because we feel our own inadequacy sometimes. Definitely, definitely. Now, in this lesson, we were encouraged to look at the example of Stephen. How did Stephen respond when the Holy Spirit called upon him? Well, really, serve? he displayed the fruits of the Spirit. I mean, in such a powerful way. Okay. You know? Uh, here he was, um, you know, really his, his heart was for the, the people and he, he was just pleading with them. But yet, you know, the way they responded uh, by stoning him, but then look, you know, when he was basically seconds from death, his, his thoughts were, please forgive them. You know, don't, mm. don't put this on their account, you know. Powerful, powerful thought. Let's go to the Bible in Acts chapter 7. I'd like for us to look specifically at verse 55, Acts chapter 7, verse 55, which talks about him being, mm -hmm. what is the word? Filled with the Holy Ghost. Full, of the, Full Holy of the Holy Spirit. That's right. Renella, would you read that for us? Do you have that? Sure. Acts seven fifty-five. But, yes, verse 55 says, but he being full of the Holy Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Wow. Wow. wow, that's absolutely amazing. And Curtis, as you mentioned, you know, the result of being filled with the Holy Spirit is a boldness that does not shrink mm -hmm. from sharing the gospel. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I think the human tendency is, I don't want to press my religion on someone else. Mm. Have you ever had that experience? Any of you? Mm -hmm. I, I, yes. I, I don't want to yeah. press. What do we find in the book of Acts that's overriding the timidity that we have? Or maybe, you know, we say, I, I just want to respect people. I, I don't want to be overbearing. How do you um, marry those two concepts of being respectful of someone else and yet being bold for the gospel of Christ? Rodney, I, I think of it in the context of that we need to understand what's at stake. I think mm. many times we forget what's really at stake. What's at stake is the person's eternal life, mm -hmm. not even just their physical life now, but their eternal life. And I know for me, when I'm struggling with this, I'm looking at the individual maybe, and I'm hesitant to share with them, or I'm thinking, well, they got their own opinion, just kind of let it be. Who am I to tell them how to, how to look at things? And it's kind of a theory that's in our world today we have to be careful of. But when we think that this is a soul that Christ died for, I think it helps us to adjust that and to think differently about the person we're looking at. Definitely. Anyone else have a comment here on how to balance these things? Curtis. Well, I know just, just speaking openly, you know, in my life, when I'm... Um, fearful or apprehensive about sharing my faith with somebody or, or just sharing the gospel with them, oftentimes it's because I'm afraid of being rejected. Mm. And, and really that comes down to myself and, and pride perhaps. And that's what the Holy Spirit can, can change in my heart. You know, when I have the fruits of the Spirit, pride is not one of them. 
And so I'm going to have, as Steve said, you know, a, a passion for souls that I'm going to see this person as a child of the King and someone who God just is longing to, to just, you know, care for and just to save. And uh, so that's what it, you know, for me, uh, something I know God's been working on my heart. You know. That's beautiful. I resonate with that too, because I, I get that. I mean, I remember posting some things on social media and talking to a, a friend of mine who's an agnostic and kind of being like, are you bothered by this? You know, is that okay? It's like, no, no, it, it's fine. I actually appreciate that. But I think there is a sense of kind of, ah, uh, should I share? Should I not? And it reminds me again of the prophet Jeremiah, who I mentioned was a little reluctant in the mm -hmm. beginning. And at one point he's like, I'm just not going to do this anymore. But in verse nine of chapter 20 of Jeremiah, he tries to, to stop speaking. And he said that God's word was a fire in my bones mm. and shut up. And I was weary of holding it back and I could not. And I think about mm. that. Is God's word that much of a fire to me? Mm. Does the Holy Spirit do that into my life where I just can't stop speaking. Mm -hmm. Amen. I'm tired of holding it back. I don't always feel like that, but I, I want to feel like that. You want that. Yeah. I believe yeah. that's what we need to be praying for. Now, on Tuesday's lesson, uh, it talked about the message of the cross. Is that not the message that really should be burning within our hearts, that fire in our bones, mm -hmm. and everything else we share should revolve around the cross of Christ? As Ellen White said, you know, every truth from Genesis to Revelation should come from the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. Mm -hmm. And at Seventh-day Adventist, we have a lot of distinctive teachings, right? Mm -hmm. They're all so beautiful only if they come from the cross mm -hmm. of Calvary. Mm -hmm. Curtis, I know you I like had something there. I was just going to just point back to our, our memory text, really, um, you know, that... Uh, it's the Holy Spirit that gives us that boldness as well, you know, to share uh, when maybe it's not pride, but we're just, whatever it is, it's that boldness that, that he can provide that we could never have otherwise. Amen. Yeah, that's powerful. That's powerful. We're going to now move on uh, to, you have something else? Renella. Renella, you had something, Renella? Sure. I was just going to say that I really like that you brought out that point because I think sometimes the fear that we have in sharing with other people um, can come from the fear of rejection, can come from, you know, what will people think of me? But a lot of times it can come from the fact that we don't have a relationship with that person mm -hmm. or that we're not presenting it in a way that we're making Christ first. And when you do that, it doesn't have to be um, nerve wracking mm -hmm. because you're simply sharing from your experience. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. that's what I would say to people who um, might feel that that fear is maybe you're feeling the fear because you're leading with the wrong thing. Maybe if you um, led with um, opening it up as a relationship with God that you personally have, it's a little less intimidating and it really speaks to the heart. Amen. Yeah. That is so powerful. Thank you so much for sharing. We're going to move on because our time is fast uh, leaving us. It's going so fast. So we're going to put up another poll question at this time. This is one that we want some audience participation. You will find this one on Slido, uh, and we want you to respond. So this is one that segues into Wednesday's lesson. Why do we not see more manifestations of the Holy Spirit like in the book of Acts in our times? Why do we not see it? These are the answers that you could put. Lack of prayer, not enough faith, we do not ask, or we have lost focus on our mission. We want you to be thinking. Now, I know you could put several, but on this one, just choose one question. And again, we encourage you to go to our poll at slido.com. If you've just joined us, we are looking for audience participation. So go to your web browser. If you're on a phone or a computer, just go to slido.com. It will ask you for an event code. Put in 19794, and we want to hear from you what you are thinking about this important question. So let's go to Wednesday's lesson, and let us delve in more deeply on this idea of what the Holy Spirit does in the church. Who's got a point that they'd like to bring out specifically from Wednesday's lesson? 
Michelle, I'll call upon you because <laughs> I, I know. we talked beforehand and I think you have some very good points to bring out on Wednesday's lesson. Well, you know, I was just reading some of the text in Wednesday's lesson and uh, text from Acts, Acts 4, Acts 8, Acts 13, 17, and there was this common theme about, about the Word and the Spirit together. And I was really just thinking about this and thinking about what is the basis of our faith? We think about the Holy Spirit, but is the Holy Spirit just some like feeling or impression? You know, I had a lady tell me a couple weeks ago about why she believed in reincarnation. And she said that when someone explained it to her, she could just, just feel it inside mm. herself, that it was true. And I thought about that and, and, and it was just interesting to me to know that there was this combination of the spirit and the preaching of, of the word. Um, which was the written word, but also kind of like Ranella was saying, the, the testimony of the people who had been changed by Jesus. Mm. And, and that word combined with the conviction of the Spirit uh, together seemed to make the impact that we Amen. see in Acts. That's beautiful. Mm. That, that is a fantastic comment. Uh, can you read for us sure. from uh, Ellen White's statement in the book, Education? I know that that one really resonated with yes. you, and I found it so powerful myself personally. Please read yes, it for I us. Yes, I love this quote. Education, page 126, says, The creative energy that called the world into existence is in the word of God. This word imparts power. It begets life. Every command is a promise accepted by the will received into the soul. It brings with it the life of the infinite one. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. Amen. In our world today, in our culture, how many people really believe the Bible? The, num the number, unfortunately, is quite low, Rodney, if you look at it. Uh, probably if you did a poll, the number of people who are willing to take the God, uh, the Word of God as it reads would be, oh, I don't even know what the percentage would be, but I'm a, quite sure it would be low just because of what we see in the belief systems of the churches around us. That's exactly right. And that goes uh, together with the idea of many think that the Holy Spirit is a feeling and it's somehow disconnected from the Word. And this particular lesson shows us that you cannot have one without the other. The Holy Spirit points you to the Bible, and the Bible po points you to the importance of the Holy Spirit. So very vital. Mm -hmm. Curtis, did you have anything really, else? Oh, sorry, Renella, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say I'm really glad that you brought out that point too. I just feel like we're tracking because I've, as I was reading through this particular um, lesson on this day, I thought, wow, well, for those of us that are in Western countries, um, for the most part, the people around us aren't, um, you know, don't view the Bible as authoritative or are, you know, mm -hmm. that, that it's just a good book. And so how do you, how do you, con you know, connect to the Holy Spirit and using the Word of God to reach people? And I think that it's important to recognize that the Bible and the principles in it are still absolutely 100% what the world needs. Mm -hmm. They might not be open to the actual book. They might have had some um, negative experiences with Christians or whatever it might be in the past, mm -hmm. but the principles behind it are absolutely what the world still needs. And we can still, while being tactful in, with certain audiences that we're in front of, um, still be able to promote the principles of the Bible, um, but, uh, uh, be able to contextualize it for our audience. And I think that that is still really important. It doesn't mean that we're denying the Word of God, but in certain contexts, depending on where we live, um, it might just be the principles that we're bringing out more to really draw people's hearts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Curtis. Well, I was just, you know, going to point out uh, in in what we just read from education there, it said every command is a promise. I love so that. So taking that back to the commission that we just read, when it says go into all the world, it's, it's not only a command, but it's a promise that he will be with us and that he will give us his Holy Spirit to accomplish that. Amen. So. And does God ever break promises? No. 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 The promises are <laughs> yay and amen. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand the power of the word of God precious promises, as Peter calls them, right? Precious promises that help us become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. The Bible is so very important. Now, remember our poll question. Here it is right here. 
why do we not see so many manifestations like in the early church? Notice what it says. It, the poll, you see it's moving even as we're talking here. <laughs> but the majority is we do not specifically ask. Mm -hmm. mm. That's very important. And then the next one, you see we have lost focus on our mission. Uh, what are your thoughts in response to seeing the poll? How does that resonate with you? Hmm. I, th I think, Rodney, for me, it says something very simple. We need to be personally committing ourselves to ask and pray for the Holy Spirit every single day mm -hmm. and uh, to recognize that it's God's desire to pour out the Holy Spirit in answer to our prayer. Amen. What kind of manifestations of the Spirit do we see in the book of Acts? Mm. Miracles. What kind? Well, they healed people. They healed people. Okay. Anything else? A boldness. There was an incredible boldness in preaching. What else? Mass conversions. Spoken tongues. Mass conversions. There was the speaking in tongues. Mm. The language barriers were being crossed. Any other miracles that you can think of in the book of Acts? The unity of the believers. Mm -hmm. they, that oh, was a wow. huge miracle. The <laughs> unity yes. of the believers. Do we, do, we, <laughs> do we need these things today? Yes, we Absolutely. do. Absolutely, we definitely do. We need all of these things. I believe that this lesson is calling us into a deeper understanding of our need for the Holy Spirit. My friend, Please join us as we are praying together for a baptism of the Spirit that God can do something in our day that we have never seen before. Mm. Now I'm looking at the clock. We only have a minute left. Mm. <laughs> There's so much left uh, for us to do. We're going to put up one more poll question. We want to hear how this lesson has impacted you personally. Mm. So let's put up our final poll question that we're going to be looking at. What steps are you personally going to take after this discussion? Mm -hmm. I pray that this Sabbath school lesson has really impacted you. Daily praying for the Holy Spirit. Respond instantly to the Spirit's call to witness. Move forward in faith to share the three angels' messages. And respond to the 3 a.m. call and become a missionary focused on sharing the three angels' messages. Mm -hmm. On this poll... You can choose several options. <laughs> we set it up that you could choose all of them, and we want to see that. Uh, God is doing an amazing thing in these last days. Is there any final comments before we come back to the poll answers? I just want to share that I think the most powerful thing that the Holy Spirit does is change our lives individually. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I think that's what we should be seeking the most for. We can pray and pray but we need to also look deep down inside and see the things that God wants us to change. In amen, our lives. amen. Our time is about up. Let's pray as we finish our Sabbath school. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and your grace. Please bless us and fill us with the Spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. amen.